so I'd like to introduce the next speaker. Um, this is uh, Dr. Sean Klossi, Klohesi. Uh, he's the director of the Mouse Hospital, or otherwise preclinical pharmacological pharmacogenetic uh, facility at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. His uh, title of his talk is Co-Clinical Trials of Mice and Human Patients. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to the committee as well uh, for the invitation to come and speak here today. Um, I'm very excited to tell you a little bit about the work that we're doing um, at the Beth Israel and at Harvard Medical School um, in relation to this idea of co-clinical trials and uh, how we believe that it plays into precision medicine. Um, I'm based at the, the Cancer Center in uh, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And um, as part of, uh, uh, and so very much in terms of the models and uh, the work that we do, it's very much focused in the context of trying to tackle this issue of cancer and, and this idea that um, uh, patients, when they come to the clinic, are uh, very much in the context of, um, it, we consider them now to have a unique disease and everybody's disease is slightly different in that respect. So let me see how this goes. Back. Uh, boom, 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 boom. Okay. Okay. So, I guess to, to start, I just want to give you a sense and in, in in, an idea of what we consider from the clinical trial approach and what we consider it in, in this respect. And the idea really is to develop um, mouse trials and and um, be able to carry out mild mouse trials in parallel with with human clinical trials to enable uh, and facilitate a, a, a transfer of information that we can learn from some of these models um, to the human trials to facilitate optimization and improved outcomes in terms of the clinical efforts. Um, and really, in, in that respect, um, you know, with uh, patient, um, patients that come into the clinic uh, now and in the context of disease, it's, um, it's, it's clear that um, patient populations are becoming much more focused in terms of uh, how we categorize them and how we um, ca categorize the disease. And so perhaps we can use mouse models and other kinds of models, but in our context we're, we're really focused on the mouse models in terms of expanding these cohorts and these populations. And there are two real ways and two approaches that we are taking to really do and work at this. The first is in the context of um, taking patient tumors themselves um, and implanting and grafting them in immunocompromised mice to allow them expand and carry out trials on the patient tumors themselves. And the second approach really is in the context of using genetically engineered models, so these gems, um, that act as surrogates based on the tumor genetics. So by matching patient genetics to uh, uh, these mouse model um, tumor uh, model genetics, uh, we're able to um, identify surrogates for in, in this context. And so the idea then being that we can enroll these clinical and co-clinical models uh, together in parallel and evaluate sensitivity to drugs, various combinations of drugs, and rapidly try and evaluate in the co-clinical context what might work best in the clinical context. And so I suppose if you look at the, um, the traditional drug development process, uh, particularly in the context for oncology, I think there's a number of challenges and, and uh, how we understand things now, it's a little bit different. So in the context uh, previously, much of the uh, characterization and, uh, of, of patient tumors as they, they come in, um, patients is based on pathology. Um, uh, and this can be very informative, uh, particularly in the context of looking at uh, uh, disease uh, diagnosis, prognosis, aggressiveness, uh, categorization. But now we know that actually, um, although diseases can look quite similar, uh, if you go deeper and look at a, a molecular level, uh, in the context also of molecular pathology, um, that actually various subtypes exist in that respect. And the other thing is that as patients move through, and although uh, previously in terms of how we evaluate uh, uh, drugs and move drugs through the clinical pipeline. Um, frequently, um, as, uh, as these drugs start to move through, um, we have very low response rates in, in the context of oncology trials. Um, and often low response rates, um, they are often de deemed adequate for approval of, of drug use in, in the clinic in this respect, which is not necessarily um, uh, this is not necessarily to say that the drugs are, are bad, per se, but perhaps also that um, the, the patient populations that we're looking at are not 
as well defined as what we would like in that respect. And so following on from that in the context of the proof, proof of concept is often well into the, the, well into the drug development phase that, uh, that this is uh, really defined. And so this is really no longer adequate in the context of, of how we are imagining and, and uh, trying to treat and manage disease in this respect. And this uh, pipeline is really, um, as a result, you know, we, we have the, the situation that um, um, actually, if you look at the number of new drugs and new agents that are coming through um, and that are being approved by the FDA, um, they are not increasing despite the fact that there are a lot of uh, promising agents out there and there's a lot of uh, uh, investigations looking into, into this. And um, also you have the fact that attrition rates for new drugs um, during development uh, are extremely high. So the preclinical data that we turn up with, even though we're investing huge amounts of money and, and there's huge investment in terms of patient resources, um, we still have um, a lot of drugs that fall through the, the, the process in this respect. And in the terms of uh, cancer um, and in the terms of oncology, it's very, um, we now understand that this is a very sophisticated disease. And while initially, maybe in the context of novel targeted agents that are coming through, you have populations of cells that are um, exquisitely sensitive, uh, that the drugs work very well. There are definitely populations of cells where you have adaptive compensatory mechanisms, uh, alternative pathways that get activated, uh, various rewiring of the epigenomic uh, landscaping, uh, various rewiring of, of uh, metabolism, cellular metabolism, that allows cells to tolerate and overcome and adapt to these uh, therapies and treatments. Ultimately, it gives the, the, the disease the opportunity to um, modify it, its, uh, its genome and uh, develop resistance in this respect. And so this really brings us to the need for um, improved disease models. We need better surrogates for patients. We need to account for complexity of the biological system, account for inter and intra um, uh, patient heterogeneity in the context of the cancer. It also means that you know, we really need to have a much better um, early and improved linkage of these targeted agents to molecular targets and, and be able to better predict in terms of the modeling what we're doing, what's going on. Because if we can have an early biomarker um, uh, available, um, it really decreases the risk of failure. Um, and it also can really accelerate and facilitate, you know, bringing these new drugs into the, into, uh, into the clinic. And ultimately, um, the idea of the mouse hospital and co-clinical trials, you know, we're really focused and want to look at um, uh, improving clinical trial design in this respect. And so these ideas and, and this, with this in mind, um, with uh, Pierre Paolo Pandolfi, who is also based at uh, the Beth Israel, um, we have been uh, pioneering what we consider the mouse hospital in lots of respects, which is really to provide an environment and expertise for the design of um, really preclinical trials to test new drugs in mouse models of human disease that would uh, be able to reflect and interact with ha what's happening in the clinical setting. And so the idea is that uh, we provide uh, a resource uh, specializing in pre and co-clinical testing for the GEM models and PDX models, that these models would allow us to efficiently stratify patients as they come into the clinic, that we would be able to understand which patient populations based on their genetics would be most likely to respond to novel therapeutic agents um, on the basis of the, that genetic makeup. And the other idea would be the, to be able to streamline progression of, this, uh, of, of these agents from bench, uh, bench to bedside uh, in this respect. And so our mouse hospital, um, in, the, for the, in the context of co-clinical co trials, um, you know, we, we, we aspire to really have a state-of-the-art animal facility in terms of husbandry, in terms of how we care for the animals, in terms of how they're monitored, in terms of veterinary um, care and staffing, um, to have standard operating procedures in place that would allow for uh, rigor and reproducibility, um, as uh, Robert was uh, speaking about a little bit earlier. Um, the other aspect that we believe is, is really important is a, a very strong uh, training and education aspect that would allow um, us to have very knowledgeable personnel who understand the models, who understand the disease um, in terms of uh, the mouse uh, husbandry care and uh, for therapeutic treatments. 
and then also to have um, uh, dedicated imaging in vivo behavioral tests, surgical procedures within the mouse vivarium where we can um, control uh, uh, all of these um, um, procedures to um, follow very carefully um, these co-clinical trials, as is the case for, for the human patients. And ultimately, um, we would like, we envisage really that we will have, you know, mouse hospitals um, uh, throughout the, the country and uh, internationally, and that these, um, you know, can be accredited and credentialed in a manner by which um, it doesn't matter where these trials would be happening necessarily, um, but that uh, the data can all uh, feed into a, a, a single repository and, and, and also be um, uh, also be reliable and reproducible across those multiple centers. And this is something while at the moment uh, we are very much in, still in a proof of concept um, phase to some extent. Uh, it's something that we really want to bring to the, the, into the public domain because uh, it's something that we believe that the people should also be mindful of and be thinking about as patients come into uh, the clinic that it's something that they understand and that they uh, perceive to be, can be part of their care in that respect also. And so how this, uh, we envisage that this works very much is that we have a clinical uh, center whereby we have a patient uh, care team that uh, has all the different aspects of uh, clinical care and it is mirrored by um, a mouse hospital um, effort <coughs> also, whereby we would have integrated uh, pathology labs, uh, imaging uh, structures, we have uh, expertise and, um, expertise and, and um, incentive to, to model and, and develop better models of disease. Um, we have integrated uh, computational informatics um, platforms that will allow us to uh, compare and contrast uh, human and mouse uh, data in that respect. And again, that we have a, a, a strong education and outreach effort um, that would allow us to um, better improve, um, uh, better tailor the mouse and human efforts in this respect also. And so how this happens at the Beth Israel, where we are is that uh, we have the Clinical Cancer Center um, that provides the, the care team. The cancer uh, genetics is, a, is an important part, um, various patient resources. Um, it integrates and, and uh, talks to um, the, the mouse hospital where uh, we develop the models. Um, we carry out the preclinical, co-clinical trials. Um, we interact and, and um, go back and forth between uh, patient clinical staff as well as the, the, the mouse hospital staff. And also a very important part of it is really the, the uh, Cancer Research Institute, which provides um, a, a strong knowledge base in the context of um, mechanistic studies uh, that allow us to interact with investigators, um, to go deeper in the context of what's going on with treatments, with therapies, that we can um, uh, make this something that is an iterative, iterative, iterative process that allows us to um, uh, tailor patient treatments and patient care um, to, to improve outcome. And so ultimately we have the, the ideal whereby patients that come into the clinic are diagnosed with a tumor, have um, appropriate models developed uh, for them. Uh, both the patient and the model undergo um, um, the standard of care or novel treatment get enrolled in, in relevant trials, that as we start to get results and data from both of these, <coughs> that they are integrated and there is um, uh, real-time transfer of information in this respect with the ultimate goal of being able to um, cure uh, patients uh, with the, the, the disease that they have. And so just to give you a little bit of a sense of um, some of the things that are going on uh, from our perspective in the, in the mouse hospital, um, uh, strategies and approaches in terms of um, developing the models um, and utilizing the models in this respect. There are a, a, a couple of, of projects that I wanted to highlight. The first uh, relates to reevaluation and repurposing of existing models which is just a, in the concept and the idea of trying to, we have many different cancer models available to us. Um, we're very lucky in this respect in, in, the, in the cancer oncology field. 
but trying to understand are there better ways to utilize them? Are there ways that we can go deeper in terms of uh, uh, um, our understanding of the model and relating them to the patients? Um, and this is a, a lung cancer project that um, is ongoing with uh, Elena Levantini and Dan Tannen at uh, the BI. Uh, the second uh, approach that I wanted to talk about um, is a approach in, in prostate cancer um, in uh, Per Paolo Pandolfi's lab and uh, one of his uh, senior postdocs, looking at um, off-the-shelf approaches for, for gem models and, and how they can be used in co-clinical approaches for more, more faithful modeling of disease. And, and the final uh, example is in the context of co-clinical trials themselves, perhaps looking at what we call uh, gems in action in this respect. And so, as I mentioned, we have many different models that we are available to us for, for various uh, cancers, in this case, lung cancer. Um, and uh, while th there are a huge number of, of uh, gems that already exist, um, and a number have been utilized already in the context of preclinical studies, very often um, looking and evaluating tumor response is done at a, a kind of a bulk tumor um, uh, level. So um, tumor pieces are taken for DNA, RNA, for pathology, and looked at in this respect. And so what we started to do is look and think about, can we go more in depth in the context of these uh, tumors? Can we look at a single cell level? Can we analyze various subpopulations within cells, understand what kinds of subpopulations are in there, um, look at stromal, immune, um, other tumor populations, and then also understand in the context of response to treatment, how those populations of cells respond as uh, patients are treated um, and look at uh, if we can predict emergence of, of resistance or identify populations of cells that may represent resistant populations at an early stage of, of disease. Um, and we're doing this uh, using a KRAS model, KRAS and KRAS-P53, genetically engineered model. Um, that is a lung-specific model. The disease is initiated by uh, delivery of adenocre that allows uh, recombination in the, in the epithelium of the lung and uh, that allows us to um, induce these alleles. Once we have tumor development, we use uh, an in-drop um, single-cell sequencing approach to look at uh, various populations of cells, um, look and evaluate uh, what kinds of populations exist within those tumors, and are starting to look at the dynamic response as dictated by uh, transcriptional networks within these, um, within these uh, tumors, uh, using various computational analysis to deconvolute and identify different cellular populations. Something else that we're doing with this data is uh, in uh, collaboration with Ted Goldstein of UCSF, where they've developed oncology model fidelity scores. And this is where they've been using these big data sets like the, the Cancer Genome uh, Atlas uh, data set, um, GTEx gene expression data sets, um, where they take these uh, gene expression data sets, they identify signatures, gene signatures, associated with hallmarks of cancer, be they apoptosis, metastasis, uh, cell cycle, DNA damage, and then go and look in the tumor, uh, tumors themselves and say, how are these uh, signatures? Um, for these uh, tumor models, which signatures do they hold? What, um, what, kind of, uh, what kind of hallmarks might they be best representative of? And um, by uh, also then taking um, primary human tumors from uh, 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 lung cancer patients, we're comparing um, these populations within mouse and human uh, disease to try and identify and, and, and better map and match this uh, for the, the, uh, this approach in, in the context of precision um, comparisons. The second aspect um, that I wanted to talk about was in the context of, of using um, gems and adapting uh, the models um, to better model the disease. Uh, of course, there are, in the context of the gem models, there are two predominant challenges that we often have. One is time, and of course, the other is money in lots of respects. In the context of time, often patience also is something. We have a patient that comes in, we want to try and model and better understand their disease, develop a co-clinical trial for them. They don't have a lot of time necessarily, but breeding and developing mouse cohorts can take a lot of time. And so to try and address this challenge, we've developed uh, uh, 
an, a platform that we call orthotopic graft um, of gem-derived organoids. And this is where we're trying to establish and characterize gem-derived organoid biobank for prostate cancer. And organoids are small um, uh, um, representations, or they, they are, they're ways to culture um, and grow and expand primary tissue in a 3D platform. And we've been able to isolate prostate cells, grow them in these organoids, and um, manipulate them through overexpression studies. It allows us to culture and expand relatively rapidly these, um, uh, these organoids in, in vitro. And the idea is that um, we have now, in, in, a, in a black six background that allows us to mix and match all of these uh, organoids, we've been able to expand and develop um, these uh, various um, organoids from different genetics, we're able to manipulate them um, and include additional oncogenic uh, events to study what's happening. We're able to put them back into the mice and follow disease development, look at, uh, look at uh, various um, things like environmental or uh, diet, look at uh, putting them into backgrounds where they are already susceptible to the disease, um, and we're able to develop and uh, see that prostate cancer develops in, in this setting also. And this allows us to follow evolution of the disease in, in, in various ways, to mix different populations, as often is the case in, in human patients. And so hopefully the idea is to, to modify um, and understand better the disease in this respect. And then the final aspect of, of what I wanted to talk about was um, our studies that we're doing in the context of leukemia. Um, we've developed a model for a mutant ID, uh, IDH2, which is a, um, a leukemia, um, a mutations in uh, acute myeloid leukemia that affect 20% of patients. Uh, this mutation, uh, this enzyme IDH2, resides in the mitochondria. It converts isocitrate to alpha-ketoglutarate. Alpha-ketoglutarate is an important enzyme for uh, DNA methylases um, and in epigenetic regulation. And upon mutation from, uh, of IDH2, what happens is alpha-ketoglutarate gets converted to 2-hydroxyglutarate. And this competes with alpha-ketoglutarate for binding. Um, it results in uh, epigenetic deregulation and a block in differentiation. And there's been very extensive efforts to develop clinical agents that target mutant IDH2 for therapy. Uh, one of these has just recently been approved in the clinic. And so we developed a mouse model that allows us to look at dependence of uh, the disease on IDH2 expression. And this is an inducible model, so when we induce expression of the mutant IDH2, uh, leukemia uh, proceeds in the presence of these two factors that are HOXA9 and MICE1 that allows the leukemia to, to, um, to initiate and develop. And if we turn off expression of the IDH2 um, in these primary leukemias, the leukemia no longer um, progresses, no longer develops. So we've been interested in understand, trying to utilize this model to, because of the fact that the um, mutant IDH2 inhibitors are, are in the clinic, um, to understand if we can predict resistance mechanisms that might arise as a result of this. And through a serial transplantation uh, protocol that we developed, we've been able to develop a, a model that in a primary recipient is sensitive, in a secondary recipient is still sensitive to deinduction of the, of the um, mutation, but in a tertiary recipient is no longer, um, uh, is no longer uh, sensitive to the deinduction and suggests that it's resistant to, uh, to inhibition uh, therapy in this respect. And so by comparing these different models at using metabolomics, genomics, transcriptomics, we've been able to identify novel resistance mechanisms, novel vulnerabilities that allow us uh, to intervene uh, from a therapeutic perspective. And these, ultimately, we have, within the in vitro and in vivo using GEM and the PDX models, have been able to evaluate these novel uh, therapeutic approaches and novel responses to therapy um, and uh, are currently in consultation to um, develop clinical trials that will allow us to compare the mouse and the clinical um, uh, trials for um, this kind of iterative analysis and real-time co-clinical execution. And so just to, just to finish up, to give you that, a sense of, of, of 
where we see and what we envisage for this co-clinical approach in this respect, where we have patients that come into the clinic, um, they may have, these uh, would be IDH2 patients, they may already have received this uh, targeted therapy, they may not have received the targeted therapy, they're evaluated at a molecular level, um, they, we integrate the, 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 our GEM studies, PDX studies, to identify for those moderate responders how we can better uh, convert that response into a strong response uh, with combination of, of different therapeutic agents, uh, different uh, um, strategies in that respect. And so with that, I just wrap up. I want to acknowledge um, the various folks in labs, Pierre Paul and Office Lab, um, Ellen Leventini and Tennant Goldstein and, and uh, Alan Klein's lab, for which we've been doing some of this work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Closey.